my distinct honor to welcome you to Hofstra's first Pride and Purpose debate. There are several people that I need to thank before we get started. First of all, uh, the folks in the Cultural Center have always do an amazing job in putting this, these types of things together. Natalie Dadoff, uh, Ethelene Collins, Janine Rimaldi, Carol Mallison, uh, thank you so much for everything that you do to support uh, the various activities that take place on our campus. Also, media relations, uh, the folks in uh, Hofstra's University Relations, Colin Sullivan has been working very hard on this event, Carla Schuster, and also a big thanks to Melissa Connolly for her strong support in it for uh, putting this event together. So thank you very much. Uh, Hofstra University is one of the best private universities in the United States, and it's ho had the distinct honor of hosting two presidential debates, and we hope to host a third in the next go-round. Our university has long been engaged with important issues of national and international public policy. It is in this spirit that we inaugurate our first debate on one of the key sustainability issues of our time, genetically modified food. Before we get to the debate topic, let me tell you a little bit about Hofstra University. We are the largest private university on Long Island and home to over 12,000 students. We have full programs across the liberal arts and sciences, including uh, things like uh, sustainability studies. We also have an engineering school, business school, communication school, health and human services, and uh, colleges of law and medicine. But we are also very committed to sustainability. Our campus is a world-class arboretum, and we're one of the few universities in the country to have strong commitments to sustainability by having an undergraduate and graduate programs in sustainability, a facility sustainability officer, a Senate committee focused on sustainability, strong student clubs like Students for a Greener Hofstra, and uh, Hofstra Fights Hunger. I think they're both represented here today. Of course, today we're here to talk about food. On our campus, our food service has a commitment to purchasing local food and to providing a variety of food options for, for students' dietary needs and faculty and staff's dietary needs. Every year they do a farm tour and for faculty and students so we could see where our, some of our food comes from in the Long Island area. Plus, we have two gardens on campus, some of which provide produce directly to our students and faculty. If you've eaten radishes in the in our food service in the last several weeks, you've probably eaten food grown on campus because they've produced very well this year. And our most recent garden was dedicated by noted urban agriculturalist Will Allen. And in fact, all of our incoming freshmen read his book, The Good Food Revolution, this year. We were also part of a team that helped to put on Long Island Small Farm Summit about two years ago. And many of you in here are from that organization. We appreciate your support for this event. In the coming year, we hope to, to expand our food activities, our growing food activities, and we hope to build a hoop house, inaugurate a food composting system on campus. So I think it's clear that Hofstra has a strong interest and is very serious about food. However, we all know that genetically modified foods are making their way into our diets here on campus as well as foods in other American schools, restaurants, and kitchens. But the question that has been raised by many is how safe is genetically modified food? Today, we are going to have a debate on whether or not US, the US government should have stricter regulations on GMO uh, pro products. To moderate this debate this afternoon is Hofstra's own debate expert, Professor of Rhetoric, Phil Dalton. We couldn't have a better person to moderate this debate since he's really literally written the book on it. His new book with Dr. John Butler, Public Policy Argumentation and Debate, A Practical Guide, will be out in the next few months. Besides this book, Dr. Dalton also publishes on a wide variety of communication issues, especially within the realm of political communication and argument. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for coming, welcome you here, and I'd like to welcome you here to Hofstra, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Dalton for the remainder of the program. Thank you, Dr. Brinkman. 
for people who are interested in public issues, uh, public argument, social activism, and civic engagement, this is a, a really exciting time to be here at Hofstra University. Uh, Hofstra's investment in this first Pride and Purpose debate, the presidential debates, the new speech and debate team that the school is starting in the Department of Rhetoric in next fall, make clear that we're devoted to Hofstra being a place where the academy meets the community. Now, proceeding from the assumption that, the pu that public engagement of issues through debate is a constructive means of assessing the quality of ideas, we're here today to debate the following resolution. The United States should enact stronger regulations against genetically modified organisms. And we're very lucky to have with us an esteemed panel of experts in this area. Those arguing in support of the resolution include Dr. Michael Hansen. Uh, Michael Hansen is the chief staff scientist with the Consumers Union. He speaks widely on agricultural issues and has testified before government agencies on agricultural matters. Michael Hansen is partnered with Bhavani Jaroff. Bhavani Jaroff is a, a chef, educator, and radio host and food activist. She's also widely known and respected as an activist. Those opposing the resolution include Dr. Kevin Folta. Dr. Kevin Folta is an associate professor of horticultural sciences at the University of Florida and is the interim chair of the Department of Horticultural Sciences there. And Dr. Folta is partnered with Greg Dolan, associate professor of law at the University of Baltimore and the co-director of the Center for Medicine and Law. And I want to thank you all very much for coming uh, all this way today to help us uh, explore the topic and uh, for sharing your knowledge. Now, I want to take a minute here to explain how the, the debate will play out. Uh, it'll proceed in the following manner. Uh, because the resolution proposes a change to the current system, we begin with the team supporting the resolution. Among other things, they will level an indictment against the current system. Those opposing the resolution will, uh, among other things, assess the degree to which the current system has been convincingly criticized and how effectively the proposals will be at solving problems stemming from GMOs, if in fact there are any. There are two parts to the debate. There's the constructive part and the rebuttal part. The constructive part is where all the main arguments are provided to the audience. Dr. Hansen will begin the constructive portion of the debate by supporting the resolution, and Dr. Folta will counter. Bhavani Jaroff will reinforce the arguments for the resolution, and Greg Dolan will counter. Each speaker is allowed eight minutes during this period. Those exceeding their time will be gently interrupted. Rebuttals are the period during which both sides offer a summary of their arguments, explaining to the audience why they won the debate. Uh, during the rebuttal period, Dr. Folta will speak for four minutes, summarizing his team's rejection of the resolution. And because at the end of Dr. Folta's rebuttal, uh, the uh, opposition, uh, those opposing the resolution will have spoken for nearly 12 minutes, uh, Dr. Hansen is given a longer rebuttal period. He gets eight minutes. So <laughs> when we are through, uh, we'll, we'll open the discussion to the floor. So I ask you, if you have questions, uh, that aren't asked along the way uh, to, to write them down and then when we open the floor up to, to conversation and questions, uh, please ask them at that time. I want to add one thing that I, I didn't mention. Between constructive um, uh, speeches, the opposing team at the end will be allowed one or two questions if they're inclined to ask them um, before they then get up and, and deliver uh, their own speeches. So with nothing else, uh, Dr. Hansen. All right. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, I'm speaking in support of this uh, in support of this uh, resolution, and I want to point out that actually the way uh, genetically engineered crops are um, treated in this country is there was the key date was 1985. That was when they came up with what was called the consolidated framework. And that was at the start of the Reagan administration when it was decided that we don't need any new regulations to deal with uh, products of uh, biotechnology or genetic engineering, that we can use existing uh, our, our regulations. That has led us to basically trying to put square pegs into round holes. So for example, the USDA looks at 
uh, field tests, they regulate on under the Plant Pest Act. So the only question they can ask is, will this engineered plant be a plant pest risk? Will it become a weed or cause a disease? And the, the, uh, the trigger that they use is all the first generation of uh, plants have either used a regulatory element, that is a, a genetic on switch, which comes from the cauliflower mosaic virus, okay, that is a plant pest. Or they'll often use other termination sequences or transform using Agrobacterium tumefaciens. That is actually a bacteria that causes crown gall disease. That's a plant pest, so that means that's why those plants got looked at. But if you genetically engineered a plant and didn't use any of those materials, you're completely exempt from USDA. So for example, there was a, a, a genetically engineered Kentucky bluegrass, and USDA said, well, there's no uh, plant pest parts of this, so we don't regulate it. There was also the glowfish, which was engineered so that it would glow, and this was uh, something that they were doing to zebra fish. And no regulatory agencies looked at that because they said, you know, it doesn't fall under any of our, our, any of our regulation. The state of California actually banned it for uh, moral reasons. So there's that problem. Uh, also, that allowed the USDA never looked at the problem since the main crops that are engineered right now, the main trade is herbicide tolerance. So that means you can spray herbicides on them. You could have predicted this will lead to herbicide tolerant weeds, but nobody looked at that because it's not under the USDA's purview, and EPA doesn't actually look at the, uh, at the herbicide tolerant plants. That's not their job. So that's USDA. FDA, they made the decision back in 1992. Uh, then Vice President Dan Quayle, uh, the White House Office on the Council of Competitiveness, put out the policy uh, on May 29th, 1992, at a biotechnology industry organization gathering, and they said that genetic engineering is an extension of conventional breeding, therefore no special safety assessments are required. And in fact, what happens is there's only voluntary safety consultations. Before I continue, I should say that there's actually global agreement that genetic engineering is different than conventional breeding, and there should be required safety assessments before the products are allowed on the market. This is done through Codex Alimentarius, that's the food standard setting organization of the UN, jo jointly run by the World Health Organization and the Food and Agriculture Organization. All the standards and documents that come out of Codex are functionally written into the World Trade Organization uh, agreement. So that means we have global agreement now that genetic engineering is different, there should be required safety assessments. The US does not do either of those. And in fact, their policy can be seen after the safety consultation, the FDA doesn't make any conclusion about the safety. What they do is, here's what they tell the uh, company. This was a letter that was sent to Monsanto on September 25th, 1996, about their first BT corn variety, Mon810. This key sentence reads, quote, based on the safety and nutritional assessment you have conducted, it is our understanding that Monsanto has concluded that corn, grain, and forage derived from the new variety are not materially different in composition, safety, or other relevant parameters from corn, grain, and and forage currently on the market and that they do not raise issues that would require pre-market review or approval by FDA, end quote. So the agency never makes a conclusion about the safety of any of these crops. They say they understand the company thinks they're safe and there should, and there's no a reason for pre-market uh, uh, review. That sentence, a variation of that sentence is in all 97 letters. So that shows the agency does not make any conclusions and they don't do safety assessments. I should also point out the AMA, in June of last year, they changed their policy on GE uh, food, or what they call bioengineered food, to one where they now quote, our AMA supports mandatory pre-market systematic safety assessments of bioengineered foods. Um, and again, the agency is not doing that. Finally, I want to talk about the problem of trying to find problems. That needs independent research. That is being uh, stymied because of intellectual property concerns. The companies get to dictate the uh, research that that gets done. In 2009, uh, 26 scientists actually sent a uh, letter to the EPA and uh, they protested, protested that, quote, as a result of restricted access, no truly independent research can legally be conducted on many critical questions regarding the technology, end quote. Here's some examples that have been from the public literature. I'm quoting from a paper that was in Nature Biotechnology. 
Quote, in 2001, Pioneer was developing a transgenic corn variety that contained a binary toxin, Cry34AB1, Cry35AB1, to fend off rootworms. The company asked some university laboratories to test for unintended effects on a lady beetle. The laboratories found that nearly 100% of lady beetles that had been fed the crop died after the eighth day in the life cycle. When the researchers presented these results to Pioneer, the company forbade them from publicizing the data. Quote, the company came back and said, quote, you are under no circumstances able to publicize this data in any way, end quote, says a scientist associated with the project who asked to uh, remain anonymous. Because the pro product had not yet been commercialized, the research agreement gave Pioneer the right to prevent publication of the results. Two years later, Pioneer receives regulatory approval for an anti-corn rootworm variety with the same binary toxin. The data they submitted to EPA showed no potential sign of harm to uh, lady beetles. In one study, the company fed purified toxins to the lady beetles only through the seventh day of the life cycle, one day short of what was found to be their most susceptible um, um, stage. The anonymous researcher still maintains that the Pioneer studies are flawed, they were, EPA was made aware of the independently produced data. They a opted not to act, and the Pioneer still won't allow the scientists permission to redo the study after the crop was commercialized. Dr. Bruce uh, Tabashnik, who studies these, uh, Bruce uh, Tabashnik says a Dow AgriScience employee once threatened him with legal action if he published information he received from the EPA. The information concerned an insect-resistant variety of maize known as TC-1507, made by Dow and Pioneer. The company suspended sales of TC-1507 in, in Puerto Rico after discovering in 2006 that an army worm had developed resistance to it. Tabashnik was able to review the report the companies filed with EPA by submitting a Freedom of Information Act request. Quote, I encouraged the employee of the company, Dow, to publish the data and mention that alternatively, I could cite the data, end quote, says Tabashnik. Quote, he told me that if I cited the information, I would be subject to legal action by the company, end quote, he says. These kind of statements are chilling. This is unacceptable. To my mind, this is just like saying, where would we be if we allowed the tobacco companies to dictate what kind of research gets done on a tobacco? So a, uh, a regulation that needs to be done is safety assessments and other things. Scientists should be allowed to do anything with these crops. They should not have to have um, agreement from the um, agencies, That's from the uh, company. And uh, I guess I'll end there, because there has not been adequate assessment. You say that. Uh, are there any questions for? Sure. Do you know of the, what is an academic research license? Uh, yes, I, and I do know that an agreement that Monsanto and the companies have, quote, come to agreements with these companies about, uh, with the universities about the research they can do, but will they make those letters of publicly available so that anybody can see them? The answer we've been told is no. I can send you one. Um, what about people who can, uh, University of Missouri, University of Nebraska, University of California Davis, can generate any transgenic plants you want, and you can use them independently of any kind of company. Uh, Yet, but if you're trying to assess the safety of products that are on the market, you need those particular transformation events, and you need the near isolines to test them. And I can give you examples of scientist after scientist that wanted to do experiments and were told, no, they can't. Uh, um, I can tell you scientists that wanted to look, for example, and sequence where the transgene is to, and to see if it's moving, and they're forbidden from doing that. They can study this, but they're forbidden from sequencing. So the agreements that the universities come to, this is not all transparent. The companies cannot get access to near isolines and other things to do their research. And I can quote you scientists, someone from New York University actually found adverse effects uh, of cry protein streaming out of the uh, roots. Gunther Stotsky, he actually went to Monsanto and said, I'd now like to do the same thing with some of your varieties. And they said, sorry, we don't think this research is important. So nope, you can't do that work. What was the uh, conclusion of Stotsky's paper? In terms of significant results, what, what, were the, what was the maybe the next to last line of the abstract? Uh, the original paper was the 
cry proteins were streaming from the corn roots into the soil, and they were at levels enough that uh, could be toxic to um, uh, to lepidopteran pests. So there's enough there, and there would be different levels because uh, some plants will probably have much lower levels of this happening, so you want to look at others, and he was not allowed to further Thank that you. work. I can, Norm Elstrand had tried for years, wanted to look at uh, look at this issue of not only gene flow, but also uh, whether the transgenes are uh, moving. They had a two-year negotiation with uh, Monsanto. They were allowed to look at the Roundup Ready corn variety and see whether it was crossing into Teosinte, the wild relative of a corn, but they were forbidden from sequence it, sequencing it. So there's stuff that cannot be done, and there should just be an agreement that any of these crops, anybody can do what they want with them. That was the case before 1980. Thank you. Dr. Fulto? I'll start out by saying that nobody forbids me to publish or sequence anything. As an academic research scientist, that's the idea. I have the freedom to do what I want to do with respect to uh, materials. Uh, if a company tried to handcuff me and tell me that I couldn't do it, I'd blow the lid off it. It wouldn't be nameless scientists and conspiratorial thinking. If they want to sequence something, send it to me. I'll get it done. Um, I am a public scientist. And I'm here to support not just that uh, the regulation needs to be different. I think there needs to be a whole lot less of it. That by having stifling, crippling in, uh, in, um, uh, regulation, we slow innovation. We slow the spread of new products. We, spread this, we slow the spread of technology, especially to people who can use it. We know from the last 17 years that these products have been used, that there has not been one confirmed case of any illness or any problem associated with them with respect to health. We know that there's tremendous benefits to the environment. A 2010 book assembled by the National Academies of Science shows that in figures 2, 7, and 2, 3, that corn and uh, cotton both use half the, insect, half the insecticide they used to in the US because of the transgenic proteins that are used to deter feeding. The products work. They're in 90% of our farmland, uh, corn, canola, cotton, and soy. Farmers are smart people. Farmers know what works. A company doesn't tell them what they need to, what they need to farm and not farm. So the current policy, if anything, has greatly retarded the ability to grow these technologies. We know that they're safe. It, as a scientist, um, I can tell you that the, the uh, resistance to this comes in the form of fear. You hear a lot of people saying, yeah, but what if? What if it gets out? What happens if it does this? What if it spreads over here? These aren't gremlins and magic we're dealing with. I mean, this is science. These are molecules. I can show them to you. I can wrap my hand around them. I can uh, study them. This isn't magic to scientists. This is really rather elegant technology, and it's really super cool. And if we had a half hour, I'd sit and show you how exactly it worked. It's effective, and it works. It's something that farmers adopt because it does. And this is the big problem, is that the science scientific consensus, which I'm part of, and all of my colleagues throughout 56 faculty in my department and all the professional organizations I belong to, will tell you that this is reasonable technology. The World Health Organization, the American Academy for Advancement of, Society, of Science, the National Academies of Science, um, many other bodies throughout the world internationally, um, will tell you that this technology, biotechnology and genetically modified food, creates no more risk than conventional breeding. And I would tell you it even makes less risk because we understand exactly where that gene is inserted. We can sequence it. I could take the lines that Dr. Hansen referred to and I could give you the sequence back next week. Any of them you wanted. It's fast, it's cheap nowadays. So, it's a, so we know exactly where the genes are inserted. We know the neighborhoods. We can perform intricately uh, sensitive assays to detect met metabolic profiles. We know which proteins are expressed. It's really simple. And it's not just simple for the science to say that this is a product with no evidence of harm. It's simple for people on the outside to do that independent research through an academic research license. Uh, the person who finds definitive harm of a transgenic crop covers of science and nature and a Nobel Prize. This is in 70% of our food. There's no problem so far. 
is a problem that you can anticipate. If you ask me as a scientist to sit down and say what could possibly go wrong, you could come up with some things. I mean, certainly uh, people do uh, think that there are potential problems. But that's the big issue, is that you're, they're trying to motivate changes in regulation based on fear. You can even look at the GMO-free New York flyer you got here today. It says that it causes changes in allergens, causes changes in toxins, causes changes in all this laundry list of stuff that's never been proven, never been shown, at least above uh, conventional agriculture, conventional breeding. Conventional breeding, mutation breeding, where you hammer plants with radiation and, uh, and chemicals to damage DNA to induce variation, perfectly acceptable to organic and sustainable farming, perfectly acceptable to anybody and no one wants a label, but it's a haphazard way of going about creating variation in the genome. That's perfectly acceptable. I can wreck 10,000 genes with chemicals, no one cares. But if we change one gene in a way that's predictable, people don't like this. The problem is that it kills our innovation. And some of the things that we could do uh, remain on shelves of laboratories and, and don't get out into the field where they should. And this is one of the big problems. It stops emerging science. We know that we can increase nutrient fortification in plants in laboratories, no problem. We can increase the folate content, content of tomatoes. It was done in the laboratory next door to mine. Uh, never commercialized, never marketed because of the regulatory hurdles that keep that nutri nutrient rich tomato out of the hands of the people who could use it. We've known for a decade you can increase the amount of vitamin A. Uh, new cassava, increased amounts of iron. Um, the, the products that are targeted to serve the world's poorest people with nutrient enriched foods are not being allowed to be developed. And Dr. Hansen, before the presentation, he says, well, they've been promising this for a long time and they can't do it. And I said, yeah, but you're the guy who's standing in the way trying to stop it. So if we open the floodgates and we allow more products to be developed, and of course, safely disseminated, nobody wants to harm people. And there is a rigorous process to get something approved, which I would really, which I really, uh, uh, which, which is absolutely in place. The USDA has, done, has taken applications for uh, something like 70, 171,000, I have the exact number, um, trials over the last uh, 117,799 testing permits over 161,835 sites and concluded no risk to agriculture. The FDA doesn't have a hard and fast solid mandated, solid mandated protocol because they want it to be specific for each individual crop. When Dr. Hansen says that it's um, that Monsanto, that, that the FDA said, hey, whatever, go ahead and uh, give us your data. What that means is, is that they tell the, the, uh, the FDA tells Monsanto, hey, you do the experiment, you bring us back the results, and if we don't like the results, you're going to do more experiments. That's why it costs $100 million to commercialize a GM crop and takes between five and 10 years these days. It's not a rubber stamp. It's a stringent process. So the last thing I'll wrap up with, some of the other collateral effects. When we start to have regulation and over-regulation, it draws suspicion of good technology. It harms non-GM industries, where activists target things like tomato and orange juice, saying that they're transgenic or that they're GMOs when they're not. Um, it, it, uh, it, it leads to the more, it, um, it also causes problems with distrust of science and scientists, and even threats and vandalism. As a concluding statement, I can, I can say that um, critics will tell you, you know, that this stuff hasn't delivered and that it is problematic and toxic. But if you go back to the original research papers and you look carefully at them and you ask a scientist, a public independent scientist, for their thoughts on those papers, you find that the papers, the people, the activists against GM crops and asking for more regulations are trying to spread fear over education. Do we have uh, one or two questions for Dr. Polka? Um, yeah, I have a question. You said uh, that nobody's ever, for example, demonstrated uh, any problem with allergenicity. I wonder if you're well uh, aware of the work done by Dr. Zola and colleagues where they use proteomics and they looked at MON810, Monsanto's BT corn variety. They looked at the near isoline. They grew them in a growth chamber. So that means the environment's the same. The only thing that's different would be whether it's engineered or not. And they did proteomics. That means you're looking at all the expressed proteins. And what the study found is there were 43 proteins in the mon Kent plants that were significantly disrupted. Here's the important part, though. In the 
uh, in the near ice line in the parent plant, there was a gene that was turned on that was off in MONA10. That gene, quote, a newly expressed spot that's in the uh, near ice line corresponding to a 50 kilodalton gamma zine, a well-known corn allergenic protein was detected. So that means they were able to show in the near ice line a known corn allergen was turned on. So what is the question? In the engineered one. So you said that well, there was no it. evidence. There's one where a known corn allergen, it's not on in the near ice line, it's turned on in MON810, and okay. it said, moreover, as a major concern, a number of seed storage proteins, such as globulin and bacillin-like embryo storage proteins, that's what you're going to be eating if you're eating seeds, it exhibited truncated forms having molecular masses significantly lower than the native ones. What impact would that have on food safety? Don't know unless we do the feeding study. So you said that there was no evidence of allergenicity. Here's one where a known allergen gene is turned on. It's a 50 kilodalton gamma zine. That's a known corn allergen on in MONA10, not on in the near ice line. Okay, Dr. actually, Fulton. I know the study really well. And the way that you detect the proteins is by using IgE serum from uh, individuals that produce allergies. This study used serum from two independent or two different people. It wasn't a very extensive study. In one of those two people, they detected a protein on proteomic studies called gamma zeon. Gamma zeon is not an allergen in humans. The only uh, major corn allergens are uh, lipid transfer protein, which is unchanged between the isoline and the transgenic. <coughs> Um, the uh, work was actually published, I don't remember the author's name off the top of my head, but the final conclusion of the authors of that paper, which I would encourage you to go look at, it's, uh, I'll, uh, I can't remember the author's name, but it was just last year. Uh, the authors concluded, no problem, there's just this one difference. And anybody who analyzes this paper, seeing one spot on a gel um, in, uh, in one replicate from one individual serum, would we'll consider this something worthy on following up on, but uh, not something that would be conclusive evidence of harm by any stretch. Thank you. Um, why don't we have uh, Bhavani Jarrah come up for the second affirmative. Hello. Okay, so um, there have not been many independent studies uh, most of the studies, as was mentioned before, are funded by the uh, biotech companies. Um, in, in the early days, the FDA did have a lot of concerns, um, and most of those concerns, which are visible in the original handwriting on the responsibletechnology.org website, you can actually see these memos that were passed back and forth. There was a lot of concern, but those concerns were squashed and never came forward because at the time, uh, the official in charge was Michael Taylor, who was a former um, Monsanto employee, and um, he actually left the um, FDA and became the, a VP at Monsanto. And what we've seen as, we've, have, as I have studied this issue, that Monsanto has embedded themselves so well into politics that we're not really getting clear, clear studies. Um, in 1998, there was a doctor Putai in um, the UK, and he um, actually won a bid for over 1.7 um, million pounds out of 27 scientists to do studies on GM crops, and he was actually a supporter of GM crops. He was shocked by the findings that he found. He found that, um, that in the rats that he did the experiments on, there was increased um, liver damage, um, shrunken brains. I mean. The list went on and on. There was a lot of stuff. And um, he actually went on public TV, talked about it for a day. He was like a hero. This took place at the Rowett Institute. And um, he was, a, you know, like I said, a hero for a day. And then Tony Blair made a phone call to the president of Ro Rowett Institute. And um, basically, this uh, scientist was fired. And as you read, you see studies over and over again where this kind of thing is happening. Um, in Canada, just uh, in 2011, doctors at Sherbrooke University Hospital found that Bt toxin was found in the blood of um, pregnant women, babies, and in non-pregnant women. And there's you know, basically two kinds of the GMO crops. There's the GMO crops where the DNA is spliced with the pesticide Roundup, so that they're called Roundup Ready. And then there's the other kind where the, um, where 
um, the DNA, where I'm sorry, where the pesticide is um, injected into the into the gene, so that the pesticide is continuously being made, and that is um, that prevents. Um, the pests from eating the plants. When they eat the plant, they actually, their stomachs break open and they die. And it was told by the gen biotech companies that when that, um, when that plant is eaten by a human, that the human digestive system would kill it. And this study showed that that pesticide regeneration is continuing inside of our bodies. And, um, you know, that was a huge study and that's in, was published in the Reproductive Toxicology. Um, and also, when you say that there's no no proof in the health, if you look at the health of our country, um, I would say that allergies have skyrocketed. When I was younger, everyone ate peanut butter. Everybody could eat bread. Um, there wasn't gluten allergies. There wasn't all the autoimmune diseases that there are now. Yes, there is no direct proof, but you have to stand back and look at the situation. And all of these um, increased allergies and ills are directly linked in timing to when GE crops started infiltrating our food system. The other thing is GE crops infiltrated our food system without our knowledge. Um, like I said, you know, there's a study that was done in the UK. Um, that became public, and because that became public, even though the um, scientist was fired, it still was out in the news, and there was a lot of write-up about it, and that is when the moratorium on banning uh, GMO foods started in the European nations. And now um, the moratorium for banning is over, but they do require labeling. And over, I'll tell you, over um, 25, uh, wait a minute, 64 countries require labeling, um, including all of the EU co countries, Japan, Australia, Russia, India, and China. And over 26 countries have banned them completely. Um, and I have a a PDF that I pulled off of the Nestle website um, that actually states that Nestle makes all of the products that they make here in our country, they make for the European Union without genetically modified ingredients because, as they say here, consumers' confidence is essential to us and is supported by having access to information. Consumer, Nestle's consumer services are well equipped to provide this access in each country and thus are the first source of information for Nestle products. And it goes on, and it's just basically saying that they care about the consumers in Europe. And so as a result, they make all of their products, products GMO-free. And the real fear is not so much from people. The real fear is the biotech companies and the manufa food manufacturers. They're afraid that when the word gets out and people know about GMO products, that even if we get labeling, the labeling is not the issue, because they say the labeling will cost so much more money. That's not really the issue. The issue is that once it's labeled, people have a choice of buying a product that's labeled GMO or not. They're going to buy the one that's not. And so all of the companies will start will need to remanufacture their products GMO free in um, in this country as well. And I actually have um, I pulled up another another article from Friends of the Earth. And here there's Nestle, Philip Morris, Kraft, Unilever. Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, Diago, Mars, Dannon, Anheuser-Busch, Heinz, all of them make their products GMO-free for the European markets and the markets where they need to be labeled. Um, there's so many derivatives that come from these GMO products as well. So, um, you know, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, soy lecithin, all of these products that are in the small print in the ingredients, nobody knows, but they're GMO. And as um, it was mentioned before, the majority of processed foods and the majority of the foods in our supermarket, over 80% contain genetically modified ingredients. And people don't know that. And there's still people today that don't know what a you know, GMO is. And so it's really important that we start labeling the same way we label for allergens now, when we label for gluten. We need to label if something contains a genetically modified ingredient so that people have a choice. Um, there was another study which I'm sure many of you heard about just last year, 2012, by a Dr. Seralini. This, this was in France. And this showed, this is a long-term study on rats, and it showed that um, they all, all developed tumors, um, cancerous tumors, 
and numerous other problems. And it was um, published in the Food and Chemical Toxicology um, Journal. And then just last week, it was retracted. And why was it retracted? It was retracted because Monsanto complained. They created a new editor position called Associate Editor for Biotechnology. And guess who was appointed? Richard Goodman, a former Monsanto employee. So you just see Monsanto is everywhere. And they really, they really are influencing so many, so many different um, areas that we are not getting, we're not getting an honest, honest assessment. So um, just having things better regulated so that we can actually at least have labeling, we have the right to know. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one or two questions for Ms. Jara? Yeah, two questions in the spirit of honest assessment. In the retracted Seralini paper, did the control rats get tumors? Table two. Sure. Yes, they did. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I don't know. Okay, yes, they did. And they didn't show that in their figure of the three grotesque rats because it was a fear-driven paper, not science. The other one, Aris and LeBlanc, 2011, on a Canadian study with uh, DT umb umbilical cords and fetuses in pregnant women. Um, and I encourage everyone, look at figure three in that paper. Um, figure three, uh, are the levels of the toxin ever significant above noise? I'm sorry, I can't answer well, that. Well, you made a but very I would, I would say that if you, if you go to, excuse me? Uh, I would ask you, what do you mean above uh, Meaning that level, if you because Aris and LeBlanc have actually replied uh, to that consideration because in the controls, which also used human sera, they did not detect anything. They, uh, so I guess why I'm asking this is because this needs to be a scientific discussion. And if you're going to cite this as evidence against GM, you have to look at the standard curve, which is figure three, and compare that against the materials and methods. And that the numbers they were getting as their data saying between not detectable and 12 nanograms per milliliter, which is almost none, is below the threshold that the kit can detect. And yes, it's very true. Well, I mean, well and everybody should do this. Find the paper, Aris and LeBlanc, uh, 2011, and compare the materials and methods and the standard curves that were used. And also keep in mind that the test kit they use is not for use with human serum. serum. So. I would challenge all of you to go look for on your own. You'll find that uh, what I'm saying is exactly in line with how a scientist would take a look at that. Uh, yes, and I would also tell people also look at the response that uh, that the two scientists did. And as for Cirillini, this paper that is uh, retracted, it should be pointed out that there's the uh, Committee on Publication Ethics. Right? There's only three reasons to uh, retract a paper. It runs. Um, and those are clear evidence that the findings are unreliable due to misconduct, data fabrication, or honest error. Two, plagiarism or redundant publication. Three, unethical research. None, None of, of these those. were the case with Seralini. What they said that's is because the data was inconclusive, particularly that the number of rats, it was the sample size was too small. They only used 10 rats. Well, guess what? Monsanto published a, a feeding study in the same journal eight years before concluded that there was no problem with safety using 10 rats. So, so somehow it's okay to method. say right. they also said the type of rats were not the right rats. But if the same rats. to say that it's unsafe based on 10 rats, that's too small. Ms. That's Jara? inconsistent. And again, you do not retract papers because uh, data is inconclusive. Let's, let's give uh, Mr. Arup a moment to respond, and then we'll move on to uh, Well, I'd like to just add that going. the American Academy of Environmental Medicine said um, on May 19th, quote, physicians need to educate their patients, the medical community, and the public to avoid GM foods when possible and provide educational materials concerning GM foods and health risks. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine. It's just, it's, you know, it's just not good public policy to allow GMO products into our foods without proper labeling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Greg Dolan. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a professor of law, so I will confine my remarks mostly to the legal issues that were raised. I'm not, uh, although I have a sci I have scientific training, that's not what I'm going to focus on. Um, let me begin by saying that I guess 
I'm happy that uh, uh, Professor Falta and Ms. Jarrett agree, at least on one issue, that this is in fact driven by fear, right? So Professor Falta said that, and uh, Ms. Jarrett got up there and said but, that. But well, I said my the fear that I'm referring to is the fear on Monsanto and and the manu food manufacturers that they're going to have to reform formulate their products. My my point is that this is not you know as we've just. There's not a necessarily scientific consensus, and it is driven by fear, perhaps on a number of sides. Let me begin with a case that was decided in the Supreme Court in the early 1980s. It's called Chakrabarty versus Diamond. Dr. Ananda Chakrabarty invented a bacterium that was genetically modified bacterium that was useful in digesting oil. So it was, it was thought that this bacterium could be used for to uh, take care of oil spills. He sought to patent it. The patent office rejected his patent application. He litigated this rejection all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And there were briefs filed by respected scientists, by Nobel laureates, who said, we cannot allow this to be patented. Why? Because it's going to allow us to have you know, human-animal hybrids. We're going to destroy. It was in the Supreme Court briefs by Nobel laureates. We're going to destroy humanity by doing that. 1980, I mean, this sounds incredible. This sounds like a crank position in 2013. Mm -hmm. But that was a position of a Nobel laureate, not just one, in 1981. And so the same thing we're seeing here now. These, these positions are very similar to what was presented to the Supreme Court in 1981 and was rejected by a vote of 5 to 4. It was actually a very close case. Now, let me move on since I, I, I do in fact teach intellectual property. Let me move on to the assertions that scientists cannot test and cannot conduct proper studies on uh, 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 these genetic modified crops. That is completely untrue for several reasons. Number one, if you go out and buy, whether it's a car or a stalk of corn or a bushel of uh, peas or whatever it is that you want to buy, once you bought it, the patent rights of the patent holder are exhausted. Once you bought the item, you can eat it, you can feed it to your animals, you can throw it out, you can run tests on it. Once you bought it, all patent rights of the initial patent holder have been exhausted. They've sold it to you. Now, you can make more peas. That's true. But with that particular bushel of peas or corn or whatever you bought, that's yours to do whatever you want with it. That's just the first reason. Second reason, since the founding of the republic, we have had an ex experimental use defense doctrine. It is not patent infringement to use a patented method or device simply for purposes of experiments. Okay? If you're in Supreme Court cases are legion that say if you're using it to satisfy your intellectual curiosity, not to sell, not to create a better product of your own, simply to satisfy your intellectual curiosity, that is not patent infringement. So uh, uh, Monsanto or anybody else simply cannot come and tell you, you should, you're not al allowed to conduct these studies because <laughs> you're infringing our patent. I mean, they can say it, but uh, that's just, you know, they will never win that case. Third reason. Beyond this sort of baseline experimental use defense, in 1984, Congress passed an act called the Hatch-Waxman Act, which specifically says that any study that is conducted for the purpose of submitting information to the FDA is exempt from is is not going to be considered to be, to be patent infringement. So, for these three reasons, scientists can do whatever they please with whether it's re, you know whether they are uh, modified or non-modified products. Um, I mean, the same thing goes with companies forbidding publication of data. It is true if the product is not on the market and companies engage the scientists to conduct essential studies in secret for them to provide their studies. Sure, they have control over it because they're paying that scientist. But if you want to go out and buy your uh, buy products that are on the market to test them, you're free to do so. And in fact, tobacco companies that you brought up are an excellent example. There's plenty of genetically modified tobacco products, okay? and people do Not studies the on them. And people do studies on that. So, what, what, one more issue in terms of whether or not it's possible to sequence these genes. Again, Supreme Court has decided just this past term a case, and I'll just, in the interest of full disclosure, we're talking about transparency. I filed the amicus brief in that case. Uh, Supreme Court decided a case on patentability of genes as a general matter. Supreme Court said that unmodified genes are not patent eligible subject matter. So pure sequencing that has been known for a while, you can do. Okay? This is this is this is now law of the land. This is so these fears are completely unfounded and simply stem from completely understandable problems. 
scientists don't know the law. And that's, you know, just like I don't really know science, even though I understand it if it's presented to me, but I don't know it because that's not what I do. Scientists don't know the law because it's not what they do. In fact, just last week, I, uh, I along with a number of other law professors, all of us also scientifically trained, uh, sent a response to a peer-reviewed scientific journal, a response to a study that was published that claiming that 80% of human genes are already patented. And we said, well, that's just not true because you don't understand what a patent is. You don't understand how to read a patent. So these fears are completely unfounded. Finally, um, I think I might actually end early. Um, but let me point out a couple of things. Monsanto may be everywhere. Monsanto may be, you know, the big bugaboo of the opponents to GMOs. But here's the thing. It's the people on the other side are not also doing it out of goodness of their heart. There's big money on the other side. The reason why Monsanto is uh, selling non-modified things in Europe is because Europeans are there to protect their farmers. French farmers, for example, they get huge subsidies from their government. And if they have to compete with GMOs, they simply cannot compete on price. So one way to not compete on price is not to have GMO products, because they're using the old methods of production, which is nice and rustic and great, and you can visit those farms, and it's great for tourism. But you cannot compete on, on price if you're going to sell corn, or if you're going to sell uh, rye, or anything else. And so th that's why there are these bans. The last, uh, the last actually two points I want to make is that a lot of what we've heard from the proponents is essentially confusion of correlation with causation. It is a classic logical fallacy. Correlation does not equal causation. Mm -hmm. And there has not <coughs> been a study showing that, there's, uh, that a GMO actually causes any product. My final point is this. We're, we're, now, we're now being asked to provide more regulation, more labeling, and so on. Do you want the government that cannot run a website to regulate in greater detail your food? I doubt, doubt it. Thank you. Are there one or two questions for Mr. Dolan? Uh, yeah, you said with this IPR, scientists can do whatever they want. The technology agreements uh, that farmers must sign when they buy the seeds forbids the farmers from doing research and forbids them from giving those seeds to scientists to do research. And so when these 26 public sector scientists wrote to EPA in 2009 saying they couldn't do their work, they had to do it anonymously because they were afraid of um, retaliation. And the Scientific uh, American, their editors, even published uh, an editorial that said, quote, we also believe food safety and environmental protection depend on making plant products available to regular scientific scrutiny. Agricultural technology companies should therefore immediately remove the restriction on research from their end user agreements. You act like this never existed. What, what, what I'm suggesting to you is that if you buy those, if you're a farmer and you buy those seeds, even with a restrictive end user agreement, eventually those seeds grow into stalks of corn. Those stalks of corn presumably have the same DNA makeup as the initial seed. And those stalks of corn can be sold on open market to anyone to do anything you want with them. You can use them as food, you can use them as substrate for your experiments, you can use them as baseball bats. No, if you use those seeds and plant them and you have not bought them from Monsanto, you can be sued by Monsanto. That is just Farmers not, are being sued all over by Monsanto, even when the wind blows those seeds onto that their property. That is not true. Monsanto actually gave a disclaimer. There was a case argued in the United States Court of Appeal for the Federal Circuit, where I spent two years clerking. There was a case argued Monsanto specifically disclaimed intention to sue farmers for having wind blown stuff over. What farmers are being sued for is by going out, buying seeds, and then replanting them. That's about, so when they regrow another crop of seed, not the first one, the no, second, the no, third, no, the fourth no. one, that was the case that was, that was decided in Supreme Court in 2013, a case that I, uh, I recently wrote an article on called Bowman versus Monsanto, where farmer bought the first batch from Monsanto, planted it, sold 90%, kept 10% for himself, replanted, sold 90%, kept 10% for himself, replanted, and so it's paying for one generation of GMO seeds, got three or four out of it. That he got sued for, and that is infringement. But that first generation that he grew out of the initial seed that he bought from Monsanto, 
is his 100%. The Supreme Court has said so. Monsanto, during the oral argument, conceded it is his. Thank you, Professor Dolan. I have, I have one more question. One question. Um, if the, the FDA um, has said that GMO seeds are substantially equivalent, why is it then that they can be patented if they are the same? Because you are asking, I mean, you are asking two different questions. Uh, you are right. If the U.S. P patent and trade organization or department Ima says uh, that it can be patented, imagine, imagine the following: just to, uh, to get it away from the GMO seeds, you invent a new airbag. Okay, it, it acts just differently. It provides the substantially the same safety it, because of it actively. You can certainly patent it. Now, are you going to be commercially successful? Maybe not. But if Maybe the first one can't be patented, the why can the second an one? an airbag and an engineered plan is that's a living thing. Adding one or two genes, you have not created anything. What about the indigenous people that develop these crops? They get nothing out of this. So okay. there's actually an argument that none of these genes should be allowed to be patented at all. It used to be life could not be patented. Thank that's you, Mr. Dolan. That's never the case. Um, we're now going to move into Dr. the Martin. rebuttal period, and we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Fulta who has four minutes to summarize the opposition to the resolution. So as you can hear, most of what the opposition, or most of what the uh, people for the uh, resolution are suggesting is based on evidence that's based on fear, confusing co correlation and causality, claims that there's these vast conspiracies of unknown scientists who won't let you do things and won't let you publish the research. I've been asking, Somebody tell me who these small farmers are who got sued from seeds blown in and, I, and for years, and I haven't gotten one name. There's people who've been sued for 1,100 acres of them. That's true. But this whole this is part of the whole idea. It's to make you make you feel to bring fear to you that the current system isn't protecting you. The paper from Seralini that was brought up, and I urge you to look, get out your your smartphones, look up Google rats on or um, GMO rats on Google Images. And you'll see three images of three rats from Seralini's paper, GMO treated, GMO with Roundup, and Roundup treated. And all of them are grotesque, tortured animals with tumors. They don't show you the control. If that's not scientific malfeasance, I don't know what is. And maybe they're just sloppy scientists. But, but they're either sloppy or, they con or they're con conducting misconduct. Either one is grounds for retraction in my book. If you think there's no independent research, Get out your smartphone again and go to biofortified.org. Look at the generic database where today you'll find 144 independent studies that demonstrate no harm from transgenic crops. Take a look at the rest of the studies. There's over 1,200 there, many of which are funded by industry, but industry has to fund the work that they're going to do to demonstrate safety and efficacy. That's not your job as a taxpayer because it's their profits. They are the ones who are on the hook to demonstrate that. Um, another really important one to keep in mind, the idea of uh, the uh, Putzstein's work back in 1997 that showed that snowdrop lectin uh, engineered potatoes had problems in animals. That was in 1997. We're, t what, 16 years later, and nobody has replicated that study. You would think if someone had, some, that had, a, had a study that showed that 70% of our food source, uh, supply was poison, Somebody might have pointed it out. There is no conspiracy. There is no science that shows this is dangerous, at least not reproducible, verifiable science. It would be big news if it was. So I guess the way that I want to wrap up is uh, by really stating that you know, th we, there's a lot of argument about this technology. And every technology, no matter what it is, has strengths and weaknesses. And GM crops aren't perfect. Um, it's, it's one tool in the toolbox that we're going to use to feed people. Uh, we got to feed nine, mil nine billion people in 2050. I think that transgenic technology being safely working well for 17 years already, it's time to expand what we can do with it and make it a good complement to the best of what we learn from sorga organic and sustainable agriculture, the best of what we learn from conventional agriculture, the best of what we have from use of GMOs and transgenic combine this together and continue to come up with benefits for the consumer, the farmer, the poor, and the environment. Thank you, Dr. Polta. The final rebuttal will be uh, given by uh, Dr. Hansen, who has eight minutes to offer his support for the resolution. I'd just like to point out that remember what we're talking about. The debate is should the U.S. enact stronger regulations against genetic 
uh, genetically modified crops. The FDA does not require safety assessments. Letting the companies do what they want and then having a safety consultation at the end, the FDA makes no conclusion. This is not even up to the standard of if you put a new color additive in a food. I would point out that 10 years ago, the Center for Science and the Public Interest actually uh, got 14 of the safety assessments. It turns out in six of them, the FDA asked for more information from the companies and in three of them, the company said, no, we're not going to give it to you. There's nothing the FDA could do because there's no requirement. So we have to realize we do not admit there's a difference. We do not require safety assessments, period. There's been global agreement at Codex. These people that are saying this is fear and the World Health Organization has said that there's no difference between GMOs and conventional foods. That's not true. Why was there an eight-year global process to come up with what kind of safety test should be done for engineered crops. At the end of that codex process, I actually went to virtually all the meetings, uh, heading the Consumers International delegation, and in fact went to two of the expert consultations for how you do safety assessments for engineered animals. And again, there were four documents that came out of this global agreement. One, general analysis, how you do risk analysis, for foods derived from uh, genetically engineered crops. And then there were three separate ones. How do you do a food safety assessment from food derived from recombinant DNA plants, engineered plants? One's for how to do it for engineered animals. One's for how to do it for uh, using the use of engineered microorganisms. So there's global agreement. The US does not do this. So if you want to say we need less regulation, fine. But any country in the world can block our products. We don't want that. We think the U.S. needs to meet the global standard so that our products can't be blocked in international uh, trade. So this notion also that we need this technology to feed the world, that's nonsense because every year there's twice the calories harvested as needed to feed everyone in the world. The reason people are starving, the reason people are malnourished, it's the problem of maldistribution of resources. It has nothing to do with how much food is being produced. Anywhere where people are starving, you give them $1,000, they'll be able to find food to eat. So this notion that we need genetic engineering uh, to feed the world is false. And I would point out that uh, actually soybeans, which are the most engineered crop, the data clearly shows there's when you do side by side, there's a 10% lower yield in the engineered ones compared to the non-engineered ones. Half of that's due to what's called yield drag, the fact that you can't get it into the highest producing varieties, and the other is yield lag, that the, that the gene itself is actually uh, reducing yield. The reason farmers use it in this country is because it simplifies herbicide decisions. As for competition, we subsidize our corn and wheat farmers tremendously. If we didn't do that, our products couldn't uh, compete on the world market. And believe me, Brazil and all these other countries are pointing this out. So this notion that um, that these crops are all perfectly safe, the global agreement is no, there should be required safety assessments. That was done globally. The US had all their team and all their scientists there. This was the agreement that, that was come to. Anybody that wants to be part of the World Trade Organization can abide by this. So. U.S. can actually decide to do even more weaker uh, regulations. That's why other countries can block stuff that comes. There are concerns here. We're not saying that everything is going to be hazardous. And the fact that people haven't found problems, well, if you don't look, you don't find. Guess what? I, I can remember a debate 30 years ago when people were saying, DDT, it's perfectly safe, and they would drink it. Now we know that all these uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons are actually persistent organic pollutants, and there's global agreement. We need to pull these things out. 30 years ago, it was all perfectly fine. Also with this notion that farmers, they know what they're doing. Guess what? Farmers can be sold a bill of goods too. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, farmers sprayed pesticide on a calendar basis every 10 days or two weeks because they said you need to do this so that there wouldn't be pests in the field. There's no science that ever showed that continuous spraying was actually good for pest control. It's just the opposite. You were selecting for resistance, and the reason that the farmers are spraying every week is if you're a chemical company, you want the farmer to actually spray on a calendar basis because then you have more product. 
So this whole notion that the opposition to GE, I'm not against the technology at all. I just want to see any technology go through required safety assessments before it comes on the market because so many times we hear over and over, this stuff is safe. I would point out that Edward Keller in the 50s used to say plutonium, that's not a problem. Plutonium can't go through a piece of paper. So we don't have to worry about nuclear power. We now know how insane that is because even though plutonium can't go through a piece of paper, little tiny particles in the air, you can inhale them and they can cause serious problems. So just the fact, or I would point out in the 50s, we had doctors saying, smoking, it's perfectly safe. And they would actually recommend cool to help with your uh, throat problems. So this notion that um, that companies don't have an influence on the sciences done is very naive. And again, I would point out that the issue here is should there be stronger regulations? We don't have them here, right? It's not even like a food additive. With the food additive, the, the, legal, uh, the legal criterion is reasonable certainty of no harm. Engineered crops don't need that. They don't have to do anything. They do this a kabuki dance. If they're perfectly safe, fine. Let's be the uh, uh, agreement with the global community, require them to, to go through a pre-market safety assessment. Even the AMA changed their position on this so that we come into agreement with the rest of the world. Now, even though AAAS said there's no problem here, it should be pointed out that the chair of AAAS at the time uh, that is uh, doing this, Nina Fedorov, is of course a biotechnology a person who's worked for companies, was uh, helped the State Department, who is of course running around the world trying to force this technology onto all these other uh, countries. Some of this technology might be useful, but it needs to be tested before it's allowed on the market, and to not require any testing and then turn around and say, well, we don't have any evidence that there's problems. You know what? If if that's the case, and that's fine, well, maybe we should do that for drugs. Maybe we should do that for food additives. Let's just let the companies decide what they want to put on the market. We have government regulation because we've gone down that road before, and we've seen how bad the situation is when we allow um, industry to do things. I would actually suggest people, if you want to look at the history, look at why the Food and Drug Administration was set up in the first place. It's actually a fascinating history after the Civil War. There was a thing for 30 years called the True Food Movement, trying to get regulation in because anything goes. You could sell and you could do anything. That's why, actually, we developed the food and drug law in uh, 1906. And in fact, the um, that's it, right. Upton Sinclair was part of this movement. That stuff was published in Ladies Home Journal. And I'll also point out, in 1899, was the founding of the National Consumers League. And even the FDA recognizes that one of the three people who's most important in having a food and drug law, one of it was the first head of the FDA, a second was um, a, a food commissioner from Idaho, and the third one was the founder of the National Consumers League, a woman. And then I should point out that in 1938, when uh, the second part of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act came in, that was a five-year fight, too, under which Consumers Union was founded, because the founder in 1930 published a publication called 100 Million Guinea Pigs. Thank you. Dr. And I'll just end it there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking our, our panel for, uh, for that debate. What we'd like to do now is uh, open the floor up to questions that you might have for our guests. Um, Colin Sullivan is in the back with the microphone, and if your hand goes up, he'll come around to you. Hi, I enjoyed. Oh. Hello, I enjoyed this very much, um, and I and I congratulate all the panelists. Uh, uh, I have a question for Mr. Folta, and that is um, whether he can assure the audience that. All of the companies that are doing genetic research of this sort have actually uh, not decided ever not to put a product on the market because it was too dangerous. And if, if even one of those companies has actually autonomously made the decision to hold some product up because it might be dangerous, why should the company alone make that decision? Why shouldn't that 
be something that the public interest suggests should be uh, should be the product of, the, of a government decision. Okay, so um, no, I can't give you any. I mean, I, that's I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't know that. I can never make that statement as a, as a scientist. Um, I'll touch two other points briefly, just for time. Is that companies are in this to make a buck. We live in a litigious society. If any of this stuff turned out to be problematic, where you could link it to this, to link the problem back to the company, there would be a tremendous amount of fallout. And companies that are doing this, um, despite what you hear here, they meet with the FDA before they even begin to go down the path of testing. They determine from the FDA what tests need to be done, they do them, and then they come back and usually the FDA says do some more. It's why it takes uh, 10 years and $100 million to commercialize these crops. So it, I think there's nothing in it for the company to... Can, can I add to this? Um, I teach tort law, which is a uh, law of personal injury. Products that are sold on the market, whether they're cars or uh, or model, genetically modified organisms, are generally subject to a strict liability regime. It's not about it's not even about negligence. Something goes wrong because your product was improperly engineered and could have been done better. You're on the hook for the whole all of the damages. And so companies that are ultimately going to have to pay should something go wrong are not they're not interested in you know they're not in it to poison people. But let me just also add one more thing about so FDA and drugs and who's, make, and who's making that decision at the end of the day. The discussion here was that companies are doing their own studies and the FDA just rubber stamps. Guess who does the studies for the drugs? If you want to bring a drug to the market, you do your own studies at your own expense. You bring it to FDA scientists and they say, is this a good study or a bad study? They do a peer review, just like if you want to publish in a journal. This is no different. To have the FDA scientists do this, is, is an absolutely impossible task. And one last point to the notion that every single study that shows a danger to something or other is that it should be credited is just silly. Think of what happened in the 1990s with uh, silicone breast implants. There were studies that showed it had all sorts of negative health consequences. It was They were yanked from the market. right? And I, and I don't want to get into the morality of it, right? So whether we, you know that should be available or not available. But there was that product that was, you know, people wanted was yanked from the market because supposedly it had deleterious health effects. Ten years later, it turns out that all of those studies were bunk. And FDA voted to, both American and Canadian FDA voted to let those products back on the market. So the notion that simply because there's one study out there that found something dangerous that now is conclusive, that's just not true. Uh, I would just like to point out this notion that uh, companies would never put something dangerous on the market. I, I would just ask people, look at the history of asbestos, where the companies knew, and they were seeing the data from the doctors, and they kept that from the patients and others for 30 years. Tobacco as well. Uh, right, and it was only until there was a lot of uh, lawsuits to come in to force that to come out. So this whole notion that, oh, companies would never do things. These meetings with the FDA, they don't make a conclusion. What's different with drugs compared to these uh, engineered products is after the review process, the agency comes to a conclusion. And they said, we've looked at all the data, and this drug is safe to use under these conditions. You can make these label claims. That is not the case with GE. The companies can do what they want. They talk to the agency, but they don't have to meet the legal criterion of reasonable certainty of no harm. Because then you could say, here's what the studies are, here's the, how they should be designed, and if we want to get into the argument about design, I can show you how a lot of those studies from Monsanto and others in the early days were designed not to find anything, and we can compare them to what has been suggested, for example, for how you do proper allergenicity studies, and I can show you how they're flawed. And even the Monsanto people, when you talk to them now, they go, oh, no, 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 we wouldn't do that. We do something quite different now. When you have government regulation, then you can set for what kind of test to do. There is none for the FDA. The companies can do what they want. This is, there is less of a standard than putting a new food additive on. That is, a regulatory process is when the agency makes a conclusion. They don't hear. I read you that, let, that sentence. That's in all the letters. That's not a conclusion from the FDA. So don't tell me that the FDA has, has said these things are safe. 
If they did, they could put a sentence in there that says, we agree with this conclusion. The reason they don't is they know that that is not a proper assessment. And if something goes wrong down the road, then the companies would get some kind of liability protection. Because they could say, well, the government said it was safe. Yeah. This that's way, just, they that's have just not, that's, that's just not true. That's not let's how let's go to our next works. question. Or, yeah, can. can we maybe agree to avoid the grandstanding issue? That maybe we confine our, our answers to one minute and then maybe follow up after just so we could handle more of them? Thank sure. you. Good idea. Hi, good day. This question is for Kevin. Mm -hmm. I, I'm an expecting mother, and I'm kind of concerned about the GMO food. I've read up some study that um, um, they're using flounder fish genes to use in corns so that it would be resilient to the we the weather to the winter. Um, I'm not I'm not so much about the scientists, but that kind of shocked me because I don't know what is the implication, and if any, my baby even after the lawsuit will be suffering from that. So what would you have to say to me as a concerned parent about that? Sure, that, that's not true. There's no um, flounder genes in, in corn that's commercialized. Um, the genes that have been, that are present, have been there for a long time. We understand exactly what they do. The gene that confers herbicide resistance, it's the same gene, that, the gene that's put in is the same gene that's there in the plant originally with a slight modification. And it's like changing, the analogy would be like changing the air filter in your car from an AC Delco to a purolator and saying you need to redo crash tests. It's a very minor modification. And, uh, and so does science absolutely assure anything? Absolutely not. But I think you can look at the vast preponderance of the data and understand that we're living in a time with tremendous amount of wonderful food source that, uh, that is very safe. And if there was a problem, we would see it. Um, and I would just like to say, he said that there's, uh, with this um, Roundup gene, that there's only a tiny difference. I can point out one amino acid can make a big difference. And here's a, a perfect example. In hemoglobin, you change one amino acid, and that can cause sickle cell disease. And so this notion that, well, we don't really need to look, because even if there are minor changes, that doesn't mean much. They, Thank you. It can lead to sickle cell, so. Tom? Hi, uh, I really enjoyed this debate. I thought it was very spirited. Um, my, my, yeah. <laughs> my question is for Mr. Dolan. Um, if it's true what you say that you know um, farmers can buy Monsanto corn, uh, you know, sell it to scientists, do whatever they want, how do you account for uh, the proponents' claims that you know scientists have been threatened? with lawsuits from the yeah. companies. Oh, well, there's there's two answers to that. One, part of those claims are wrong, okay? Uh, I, okay. P part of those claims are wrong, and part of it is that, look, I'm not saying Monsanto and companies are like, the, and, uh, like them and their legal departments are angels. In fact, you know, I work with lawyers. I train lawyers. Lawyers, by and large, are terrible people, okay? So, and I produce about, like, a couple hundred of them every year. So, um... And so lawyers will make outrageous claims because if they send a letter and they can't threaten someone who will buy into it, you know that's you know that's how they operate. Right. But that's so true. I'm not I'm not saying that Monsanto doesn't send those letters. I'm saying that they will never prevail in court. So if scientists actually consult their lawyers, you know they will understand that they can actually proceed with the experiment. Does Monsanto send threatening letters? Of course. I mean, but then again, you know, Lindsay Lohan the other day I was reading the news. She sent a threatening letter to the producer of Grand Theft Auto because somebody in that video looks kind of sort of like her. And one of the goals in that video, I don't play the game, so, but apparently to get, you know, to get the girl in the video into uh, Chateau Marmont, which is apparently what Lindsay Lohan says. So she's like, you're appropriating my likeness. She looks nothing like her, but she's like, well, who else could it be? So lawyers send threatening letters all the time. Are they always, do they actually have always solid legal base to them? They don't. Uh, and I would just point out that's often called in the public sector SLAP, uh, strategic lawsuit against public participation. You, yeah, you'll win it. You're going to have to spend fifty or hundred thousand uh, dollars in court costs to ultimately uh, prevail. So this notion that these threatening letters don't have much of an impact because they're not going to win, if it's some farmer that doesn't uh, uh, know much going up against some huge corporation, they'll ultimately win. It's going to cost money. As for the examples I gave uh, to you from Bruce Tabashnik and others, that's, I would urge people, look at under wraps in Nature Biotechnology from 2009. Emily Waltz wrote it, and it is a series of 
things that have happened to uh, scientists. Bruce Tabashnik talking about how he was uh, threatened. That is a real thing, and it comes from a scientist. Colin, next question. Hi, thank you very much for doing this. This is really interesting. Um, I, well, this is actually for, I guess, either Professor Dolan or Professor Folka. Um, I was wondering, you talked about uh, patent infringement and things like that, and I had been made aware of a case in Canada, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. I just wondered if you could address it with um, Percy Schmeiser, uh, who sued Monsanto for patent infringement, and they did make a, sh a film about it, a documentary film called David versus Monsanto. Are you familiar with that? I, I don't know, but that's right, I got it. Yeah, I Thank actually you. know who was a professional. I know someone who was a professional witness on the case. Uh, Schmeiser had GM had Roundup resistant canola and had uh, used Roundup, used the herbicide to select the, the seeds that had the gene, kept those, propagated them, and planted 1,100 acres of them. Um, he's a darling of the anti GM world, um, but he did break the rules. He, he took something that he signed an agreement to use in a certain way. Didn't use it in that way, and we're talking 1,100 acres here, okay. and not a few seeds that fell off the back of it. So that's exactly what happened. So it's not just Canadian yeah. case. It's exactly what happened in the United States in uh, Bowman, Bowman versus Monsanto. So uh, in Bowman, there's this farmer who was, you know, he's actually fairly early. He was like in his 70s, and he bought, you know, genetically modified crops, which is sell sold at a premium because they are around up resistant. They're easier to farm. And then uh, and the agreement with Monsanto was you get one generation. You plant them, you collect them, you sell them to grain elevators. He collected whatever 90%, kept some, and kept replanting without bothering to go back to Monsanto to buy more. He got sued for that, again, litigated to Supreme Court and lost because Supreme Court simply decided the first crop is yours. You bought, you bought it, you paid for it, Monsanto exhausted its rights. But you cannot keep replicating. The case may be talking about maybe different. I just don't know. Canadian it it is yeah. different because he actually won the case against right. Monsanto because oh. it blew onto his field, which is what you were talking about before, and that's yeah, why yeah. I was so asking about it. In the United States, Monsanto has disclaimed uh, taking farmers to court for right. stuff that's This was a Canadian case. Yeah, yes. so. I actually know Percy Schmeiser. I've actually traveled with him in um, Asia. Yeah, what the deal is is they originally said they were going to prove that he bought seed illegally and did all this. No, he didn't. What he did is he was using uh, glyphosate as a burn down agent. And in an edge of his field, he did spray some. And there were some uh, canola plants that, that came out. When he disc, because he saves his seed, he, dis he did disc part of that area and planted it. But when you look at his glyphosate sales uh, or usage, none of that went up. If he was buying this to actually use, uh, then he would have used huge amounts of glyphosate because the whole point is to spray, use this uh, canola uh, so you can spray glyphosate on it. Percy was actually saving his own seed because he didn't have much weed problems. So they weren't able to prove any of that. That's why there was no real, technically, yes, he did know that some of these things came up and he did disc that up because they were on his land and he planted them, but he didn't use anything. He didn't spray. That's why the damages were $1. And in fact, what came out during the trial is his seed dealer and all that that turned him in under, under oath had to say, well, yes, Monsanto gave me 20000 uh, what is it, $20,000 worth of glyphosate to sale, and curling is a big thing up in Canada. They took him to the curling championships. They had him sit in a prime box. They were giving him the most high-end whiskey. All this came out. Initially, they were going to say, Percy Schmeiser deliberately did all this. They backed off at the end, and that's why there was that result. Thank you. But wait, what, just, what? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Damages $1 against whom? So Percy Schmeiser had to pay damages of $1? That's a loss. I mean, there may be a small, there may be a small consolation to Monsanto, but that means he was an adjudged infringer, right? So because he did, but this whole that, notion, he <laughs> never bought anything, and where it came from, it was blowing off because when they first actually, what you need to know about canola is since that's a little uh, mustard, the seeds are tiny, and actually there was the people that were growing canola uh, around him. He didn't find this out till later. They were all engineered canola, and when they the trucks would drive by, uh, a tarp actually came off of uh, uh, one of them and all the seed blew out. So his 
the seed that was on his land was uh, actually blown in, and they went after him on this uh, technicality. Thank you. Let, let's get one last question. Hello, thank you. Um, my following question is for Kevin Folta. Do you think that Monsanto working, former Monsanto employees working for the FDA is a conflict of interest? And why would the FDA hire somebody who's a former member of such a heavily distrusted organization? Yeah, you know, I'll be real brief so maybe we get one more question. You know, to me, I think it stinks whenever you have any kind of uh, essence of collusion in a government agency, and we're all full of it. I absolutely, I don't like it. I don't like it in banks. I don't like it anywhere. Um, but the proof is in the pudding. Can we find evidence of trouble and collusion or evidence of malfeasance? And uh, that's really where it lies. I'd I, like to see it much I actually disagree, despite the fact that we're on the same side. Um, wh why do you think that person was working for Monsanto to begin with? Why do you think he was making hundreds of thousands of dollars? Monsanto doesn't throw money away. They pay that money to top scientists. Do you want those top scientists to work for your FDA or not? If you don't, that's fine. But then who's going to conduct those studies? I mean, it, the question is, that has, has a person kept stock in Monsanto? That's a problem. But people change jobs all the time. I mean, it seems to me that you want nobody who's actually was elbow deep in research to then go and advise the government. That's, to me, that seems quite odd. But the best scientists you can get those is as independent. And I would just. They don't grow on trees, they worked somewhere else before. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm available. Monsanto, but they're genetically modified. <laughs> it, it isn't just at the FDA. People should know Clarence Thomas was actually a uh, used to work for Monsanto, and there's some evidence that the uh, that part of the reason that there was a Supreme Court case over GMO alfalfa was uh, because Clarence Thomas got some of his buddies, and he was a Monsanto employee. So there's a whole bunch of them that have gone back and forth. I can tell thank you. you. Now. Thank you very much, my uh, student. Ronnie O'Leary back there was correct. It was a very spirited debate, a very informative uh, debate, and I think a really good example of uh, a civil exchange on something about which uh, all parties here seem to disagree. Thank you all very much uh, for coming, and thank you also for coming.